Sounds like a plan. Okay, well, good morning. Uh, welcome to our final commission meeting for the year 2020. Today is uh, December 14th. Uh, 2020 is truly a year that uh, uh, from a personal level, I would soon like to forget. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's hope uh, prosperity in 2021. Um, in your uh, uh, December 7th email from Katie, mission members, uh, she included a proposed agenda for today and also the um, October 19th meeting minutes. I hope you all had it, you have it, and I hope uh, you had an opportunity to review it. Uh, what I'd like to do, if there's any questions or comments on the proposed agenda for today's meeting, if there isn't, I'd like to have a motion to accept the, the, uh, the agenda as proposed or presented. I'll move to accept. Do second. I have a second? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Thanks, Jerry. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Kind of half-hearted, but I, I think that was everybody. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, also, as I mentioned in the October 19th uh, meeting minutes that uh, uh, Katie presented to us or, or sent us an in in email on, uh, on December 7th, uh, they look right to me. Any comments or questions? If uh, I don't have any comments or questions, do I have a motion to accept the minutes for the October 19th meeting as presented? I so move. Leona, thank you. Second. All second. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. So moved. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I want to wish everyone a, uh, let's put it this way, a healthy holiday season. And for God's sake, please stay home. Don't travel. You know, we, uh, we need a little bit more patience. And hopefully, uh, I never really thought that hope was a strategy. But at this point, I think with a little bit of patience and hope, uh, I think uh, Q3 and Q4 of 2021, we shall start to see some success with reducing COVID transmissions and uh, and hopefully uh, the uh, mortalities that are associated with that. So um, I, again, I hope uh, everyone does have a, a healthy holiday season here. Uh, I wanna thank uh, Jen Harville, uh, Martha Murray Constable, and also Peter Hayes for the uh, fantastic job they did with the uh, three episodes of the Constable Chronicles. Uh, that, that really kind of showed the history of the Constable family and the hall that they lived in and really their impact on the North Country. I think it was produced, directed, and executed perfectly, outstanding. Um, I'm still getting comments from all across the country uh, on people that weren't able to register in time or and, and view it the, uh, the evenings that we, uh, we presented it, but I'm still getting a lot of comments from people all across the country that had an opportunity to view it on YouTube. And these are people that have history to the Tug Hill region, either they were brought up here or their families were from this area. And there was uh, a, a big interest in how they learned about this. Uh, it's, it's amazing that people still look, look backwards. Everyone looks forward, but uh, it's very important to look backwards. And uh, uh, we did a great job. Jen, thank you so much for producing that. You did a great job. You know, it's with um, mixed emotions that uh, today I wanna kind of recognize uh, Harlan Moonen's uh, retirement from uh, a circuit rider for the uh, Northern Oneida County Council of Governments. You know, over the last 10 years, since I served on the commission, I've had an opportunity to, to get to know Harlan and I have a tremendous amount of respect for him. You know, I know this is uh, only his uh, second or third retirement. He's served in other posts, uh, even on the federal level in retirement and in uh, public service. So, you know, Harlan, I, you know, I truly, you will be missed. Uh, you know, at this point, you know, Jerry, uh, Harlan worked for Jerry for a lot of years uh, at the Northern uh, Oneida County Council of Government. Uh, Jerry, do you have any comments? Sure. Uh, when I, I started, I, I believe it was in 98, and then Harlan came on board soon after and he has outlasted <laughs> four uh, circuit riders that oversaw him so he has been the stabilizing force 
I think he's been there 25 years. When he started, it was Steve and then uh, Maria and then myself and then Jen Simons. And he's still there. Uh, you know, he, he's been like the go-to guy. You can always depend on him. Anything you ask him to do, he's willing to do. And he brought to the job a lot of knowledge. He worked for his background is being a geologist for, for the federal government. So he not only knew a lot, he knew a lot of people in other agencies that was very helpful to all the towns. And anytime he went into a meeting, he always knew somebody, he always had a joke to tell, made him feel at ease. It was a pleasure to work with him. It was a pleasure to, I hate to say be his boss because I always felt we were more on the on the same playing field, and he, you know, always had a lot to contribute. I know when the commission wasn't funded and we, by the state, and we needed a lot of signatures uh, at the local government conference. John Bardo gave Harlan a package of materials to get people to sign, and he worked at it all day, and he knew how to get people to do it. So he's always been a strong supporter of the commission and its work, no cog in its work. Everybody in the area knows him and loves him. And I'm sure we're all sorry to see him go, but a much deserved rest and not having to travel nights takes a lot <laughs> off your mind. I know when uh, Lynn was still with him, he'd always come out of a meeting and, and call her and uh, do you need anything on the way home and uh, start supper? So, <laughs> you know, he's just a great guy and I know he'll be missed by many. Thank you, Jerry. You know, we, we're fortunate we have two representatives from uh, Northern Atlanta County also, uh, John and uh, Bob. Um, yeah, I hate to put anybody on the, <laughs> on the spot, but if there's any comments, please speak. <laughs> well, it was, it was a pleasure working with Harlan. Uh, he's uh, always been there for Northern Oneida County. He's done a fantastic job for us and uh, kind of hate to see him go, but uh, <laughs> I hope he enjoys his retirement. Good, good. Very good. Um, Jan. Uh, Harlan. Jan. Yes. Oh, Harlan. Harlan, you're muted if you're trying to talk to Somebody us. Somebody is mentioning my name. You. You're still yep. muted, Harlan. Oh, you're muted. Let me <laughs> see if I can unmute. I'm asking I'm asking you to unmute. Maybe that will help you unmute. I there you it. go. How's that? Is that Perfect. better? Go. That's good. <laughs> it works. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I really appreciate all those comments. Although the other night when I had a Zoom meeting in Annsville, remembering nights that I'd driven there in November snowstorms, <laughs> I said to them, if I'd known it was going to be this easy to just sit in my recliner with the, my libation of choice, be it alcoholic or non-alcoholic, <laughs> I wouldn't have retired. I would have, uh, that was, this would have been good. I could have sat right here and kept on going till I keeled over and they dragged me out of the house. But uh, anyway, uh, I will appreciate, as Jerry said, uh, not having to go out at night. I think that's probably the, the key reason that uh, I decided to finally retire and give it up is those, some of those nights get a little hairy out there in December, and January and February, as everybody well knows. And, is around the hill, but uh, I really do appreciate uh, you know everybody's comments. It's been it's been great. Um, <laughs> Steve Hunter continually says to me, "When I hired you, you told me you were going to work until you were eligible for Social Security, and then you were going to leave." <laughs> and I said to him, "Well, I lied. Uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> I decided to stay on. Uh, the job was." so enjoyable and the people were so enjoyable that uh, I, I really appreciate all the friendships, all the acquaintances that I've made. 
And anytime either my grandson or anybody is with me and we travel around, somebody always says, hey, Harlan, how are you doing? Then they say, you know everybody. My grandson says to me, I can't go any place with you that somebody <laughs> doesn't know you. So it's, uh, <laughs> I guess that's a compliment. I don't know, maybe it's just a coincidence. But anyway, it, uh, it really has been great. And uh, everybody has been, been terrific. Uh, I love the people. I love the job. And uh, I certainly hope that everything uh, will continue. Something I haven't discussed with Gene, I probably should mention it now. I am available as a sub <laughs> if, you, if you need any, any particular time when, when someone is on vacation or somebody's sick or you got people that can't cover, cover meetings as long as it's not a blizzard and uh, <laughs> not something that's too bad. I am, I am willing to fill in if you, if you need my services. Um, so just to let you know that that's available. And otherwise, thank you very much uh, for allowing me to attend the meeting and uh, thanks for your comments. Thanks, Har Harlan. I really, you know, we, Jen, I just want to say thanks, Harlan. Um, I know that Jen Armstrong really appreciated all of your support and, and knowledge when she was here. Um, but I also want to mention that I figured if if you were do, if you had done about five meetings a month, and I know there's there were times when recently you were doing six and seven, <laughs> um, but five times twelve times twenty four that's over almost fifteen hundred meetings over your your career at as a uh, an, as an associate circuit writer. That's an amazing accomplishment, Harlan. And um, I really, truly appreciate your willingness to step up to the plate and cover any and all meetings. Um, you've gone up, up above and beyond for, for NOCOG and I wanna thank you so very much. Well, thank I you. also wanted to say Harlan that I think you started just before I started. And I remember you being very welcoming to me when I first came on board and, and you're, your uh, experience with the Natural Resource Conservation Service. Now he was coming from the Soil and Water Conservation Districts. It was nice to have somebody like you uh, to connect with. And, and I also wanna thank you, the times you filled in at the NOCOG annual meetings, being masters of ceremonies a couple of times. Uh, when we were between circuit riders, you, you did a great job. So, you know, you're, you're, you really are the, we're the, and are the go-to guy. And we have it recorded that you said you could be substitutes. So don't try to renege on your work. <laughs> so I'm certainly locked in now. Is that the case? <laughs> I've, I've always had a philosophy as far as attending all those, those meetings, Gene. Uh, actually, it, it uh, kind of subsisted as two parts. One, always sit near the door. <laughs> and uh, the second one was uh, going to the meetings. I treated that like attending the circus. Uh, as long as you stay in the stands and don't get in one of the three rings, you're fine. And uh, that's uh, something I tried to pass on to Joe Rollins. People will try and get you involved. They'll try and drag you in to controversies. They'll try and drag you into uh, finding out who you really like and who you don't, even though you never mentioned that. Uh, so I said, just stay out of the arena. Just be, uh, be the person who delivers the message and hopefully they don't shoot the messenger and uh, <laughs> let, it, let it go at that. So that's been kind of my philosophy. <laughs> Give your back to the wall. <laughs> great, great words of wisdom, Harlan, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> So uh, Harlan, can I use your uh, meeting protocols going forward? And uh, I, I will footnote it that it came from you. So I always sit near the door and attending the meeting is like attending a circus. Can I use that moving forward? <laughs> yes, you absolutely may. Yes. <laughs> the beginnings of a circuit rider's credo or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> A life and times of a circuit rider. That's it. <laughs> you know, so, you know, uh, 
we are looking forward also to is that uh, as uh, public health constraints loosen up, uh, we would we, we, uh, definitely like to get together with you and break bread in your retirement. So thank you so much for your service to the commission and to uh, Northern Ada County Council of Governments. Uh, anybody else? Uh, you you can unmute your, uh, un, uh, unmute your mic if you'd like to uh, make any comments. We certainly will miss you, Harlan. This is Leona. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll miss it. I'm, I'm sure, I'll, you know, everybody, everybody in retirement, of course, as Jan said, I've, I've had a lot of part-time jobs. I think I've retired from just about everything uh, <laughs> so far. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's just a, a situation where everybody that retires says, I really won't miss the job. I'll miss the people. But in this case, I'll I'll miss both, and uh, I'm sure I'm sure there will be nights when I sit in here in uh, my recliner and look out the window when the snow is blowing horizontally and say, "Boy, I don't miss anything tonight. I'll just sit here and, <laughs> and enjoy myself." But there are other times when I really will will miss going, and uh, as I said, I'll 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 be available for as, as a substitute, so I don't really expect to disappear completely. I'm knowing uh, after all these years of being on the job that there are a lot of times when people are either sick or on vacation and or they can't cover a meeting. And if I'm available, I'll be glad to do it. And so I don't expect that, that I'm gonna be fully out of the loop, but uh, I, I just will be on a constant basis. Bob Sauer was trying to say something, and I think he's unmuted now, Bob, if you wanted to speak. Okay, well, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, well, of course, um, Harlan, when I first <laughs> when I first went on the Zoning and Planning Board in Camden uh, and the Village Board, Harlan would come to the, obviously come to the meetings, and he always had a calming effect on is he said the three rings in front of him that he stayed out of. And it was certainly a good viable and credible source of information and advice. And like he said, everybody tries to squeeze out of you what you really think or who you really like or don't like or what you think on an issue. But he always did the dance and was able to keep uh, a level uh, view of things and, and not get involved. So I know he was appreciated in Camden, uh, all the people that I have met and dealt with on the different boards have always felt that Harlan certainly provided a needed part of the meetings as, as they developed. And so anyways, the best to you, Harlan. Uh, it's good to know that you you will step in there, and and I'm sure that there'll be times that you will. Everybody knows you. You're well respected, and uh, wish you the best of luck. Stay healthy, and that's I'm trying. Yeah, we all are. So happy holidays. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Same to you. Well, thank you. Harlan, thank you. Have a good retirement. I'm here, Roger. Roger's joined us. Thanks. Good, Roger. <laughs> yep. So have Harlan have a good retirement. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You know, it's yeah, amazing how many anything. commissioners, how many commissioners are still on the commission when I started uh, over 23 years ago. It's just, uh, I mean, it's uh, it's amazing how many people are still there. I mean, it's, uh, I look at some boards uh, and the same thing applies like the town of Lee. Uh, uh, that seems, I mean, John Ertz has been there for 44 years, I think as supervisor. And uh, you know, there's just, there's a longevity there and not only on the commission, but also on uh, municipal boards that, that you look and you just kind of shake your head and think, boy, these people have really, have really managed to, to make it through these many years 
and still be actively engaged on the boards. And that's, that really is a, it's a tribute to the people uh, in government at the local level that they have really been able to, uh, to endure all of the problems and uh, hardships of going to meetings and still be there. So I, I salute all those people. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> At our uh, uh, September commission meeting, uh, Commissioner uh, Boxberger, Chernovsky, and Ritter were appointed to the nominating committee for election of uh, officers for our 2021-2022 uh, slate for uh, chairman, vice chairman, and secretary, which uh, as per our bylaws are all two-year terms. In our October meeting, um, Commissioner Chernovsky shared the slate of officers that included Tom Boxberger as secretary, Mike Yearden as vice chair, and Jan Bogdanowitz as chair, and all have agreed to run. At this time, uh, I would like to ask for any discussion around these particular nominations from the uh, commission members. I say leave the slate as it is. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> right. Right. Well, we're very fortunate that you've all agreed to continue to serve in those capacities. You know, there being uh, no additional discussion, uh, I ask at this time for any addition, additional nominations from the floor. I ask twice for any additional nominations for the floor. I ask three times for any additional nominations from the floor for our slate of officers for 2021, 2022. There being uh, no additional nominations from the floor, I ask the secretary to cast a ballot for um, the appointment of uh, and the election of um, Tom Boxberger as secretary, Mike Yearden as vice chair, Jan Bogdanowitz as chairman for a slate of officers for 2021, uh, 2022. Do I have a motion? You do, Roger. I'll second. Do I have a second? Oh, no. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Carried. You can consider Thank you. the ballot cast. <laughs> Thank you all for agreeing to serve again. Also in the packet, um, not quite sure what date the <laughs> Katie said this, but uh, in, in your uh, one of the emails that you received, there should be a, a draft Tug Hill Commission meeting schedule for 2021. Um, as you have an opportunity to look through it, does everybody have it? All the commission members have that? Yes. Yes. Okay. You know, I think, uh, and I don't want to speak for Katie, but I think uh, this is a very uh, public health conscience meeting schedule. It's she's done her darndest to, uh, to make sure all of our councils of government are represented here. And also, I think it's also that we're going to kind of leave the, the door wide open for later in the year, where actually we may be able to, to meet again in person, which would be a novel. Uh, before we, uh, we vote on that, uh, Katie, do you have any comments on this uh, draft Tug Hill Commission meeting schedule for 2021? Um, just that, you know, we've decided to, to hold Zoom meetings through, through March at this point, considering that, that, you know, I think that's definitely going to be a time where we can't meet in person. Um, this, this schedule does reflect no LGC for March. Um, typically, we would meet the Wednesday evening before the LGC. But in, in place of that, this is just the third Monday of the month in March, as we typically meet in other months. Um, you know, we get back to potentially in-person meetings in April, knowing that that's a big question mark. Um, many of these locations, I think we could socially distance at, um, maybe even meet outside as the weather 
improves, but you know that'll all be played by ear. Um, also note that uh, we did change the fall a little bit. We typically have had a regular commission meeting in October in our annual meeting in November. And we always come up with a problem against um, election day and a lot of towns having their um, budget hearings right after election day and it becomes a conflict for that first Thursday of November. So this proposed calendar has um, the annual meeting moved to October and um, tentatively threw in there the tailwater just because it's a great location, a lot of space, but you know, that'll, we can worry about totally finalizing that detail later. Um, so, in, and then um, back in Watertown in December. So technically this, this calendar does kind of eliminate one meeting um, than we, that we would typically hold. Uh, and it does hit every one of our four counties and it hits all, it hits four of our councils of governments. Plus with, if you include the annual meeting at Tailwater, it hits the Salmon Rivers as well. Um, Salmon Rivers was the only location we actually met in person this year in 2020. So I felt like if, if, if there was one we were gonna miss in 2021, that would be the one since we did hit them. That's it. But you do have the meeting scheduled at Headwaters and that is a <laughs> yeah. community, so it Correct. kind of balances out. Yeah. Good. Yep. Thanks, Paul. Any other comments on it? If not, do I have a, a motion to accept our proposed 2021 commission meeting cal calendar? All moved. All second. Do I have a second? Do I have a second? All second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Yep, move. Thank you. Thank you. Katie, let's move right into the executive director report. Sure. Uh, quickly, an operations overview. We have returned to remote work as much as possible given the uptick in community spread throughout the region. That happened about three or four weeks ago. We have not actually physically closed the office. People are, are welcome to come in if they need to for printing purposes or what have you, um, picking up the mail, that sort of thing. I have been in the office pretty much every day um, and I will continue to be as long as um, the situation remains stable. Uh, circuit riders, um, kind of giving them instructions to attend municipal meetings as they feel comfortable, um, you know, depending on the current situation in a given community, given with the board's wishes in that community um, and using their best judgment. So that's kind of how we are operating right now. We have um, seen a definite uptick in the increase of municipalities wanting to use a Zoom, our Zoom meeting platform. And so we continue to, to provide that service. And um, many of them are using hybrid forms. Some of them are going completely Zoom. Uh, budget wise, there have been no new budget bulletins from New York State. Um, again, I think the state is waiting to see what's gonna happen with the federal stimulus bill that's been uh, being discussed. We are starting to hear in the media some talk of uh, the governor increasing taxes and cutting spending if, if nothing comes through on a federal stimulus bill. So in January, we'll get the call letter from budget for our 2021-2022 budget submission, um, or not budget submission, we've already done that part, but we'll see the executive, I'm sorry, I misspoke. We'll see the executive budget come out in late January, and then we'll have a better idea of, of where we are at um, budget-wise. Uh, until then, just status quo here. And um, one last thing, I did want to still schedule individual calls with all the commissioners, hopefully before the end of the year, it got away from me this last month, it's been very hectic. Um, just to kind of touch base, get ideas for, from you all about 2021, what, what some of your ideas might be um, and that kind of thing. So look forward to a call with, with all of you in the next few weeks. Uh, regional projects, minimum maintenance roads, um, Again, uh, this is a high priority for us in, in the region and in many of our COGS and communities. Uh, I've continued talking with Albany 
have identified a number of issues that assembly program and council has with the bill and have had some, sub some subsequent conversations with internally with, with uh, some of us on staff about how to address those. And we're thinking potentially a, a rewrite of the bill to simplify it may be a better approach than trying to continue with the bill as written. It's, it's if you've ever looked at the, the language, it's many pages long, very complicated, which is part of the problem. So I'm um, having a meeting with um, staff from Senator Griffith's office, hopefully next week, or actually this week now to discuss. Um, we did make a push earlier in the fall when we thought there might be a fall session to have additional members added to the bill. And we were successful in getting all, um, I believe all of the Assembly Rural Resources Commission committee added to the bill, including Assemblyman Santa Barbara, Assemblywoman Warner, so um, some uh, additional majority members on the bill, which does help, but we'll see what happens in the coming session um, and how we move forward with that after talking with the Senator who is the bill sponsor in the Senate. Also in the email I sent late last week, there was finally a decision made on the Weichel versus Western appellate court case, second appellate court case, um, which we have been waiting for uh, pretty uh, carefully or pretty with bated breath. And I thought I had printed it out, but I'm not seeing it here. Um, but you have that. And, and basically we've, we've went back to um, Mark Jebo to get his interpretation of where that leaves us with the uh, minimum, the ability to adopt minimum maintenance road laws on a local level. He um, actually felt that, you know, the, the, the case the case was found um, pretty much against the town, but for reasons not applicable to the actual validity of the minimum maintenance law, it was more about how it was applied and the specific, um, the specific details of that situation. Um, Mark sent me an email, I'm gonna read a little bit from it. Um, he says in West Turn, the law is alive and well. Um, in a prior ruling, the court found that it was too late to challenge the validity of the law. Accordingly, the court in this case just discussed how West Turin applied the law to Mr. Weichel's circumstances. Yeah. What was want? that? Oh, somebody talking? I'm sorry, I wasn't looking at everybody. Oh, okay, it's not. So basically, um, the court avoided the issue of whether Mr. Weichel had the right to use it year round since his zoning permit was for a seasonal camp. There was a, some confusion over the, the, the permitting really process between the, the local town and the county who um, issues the building permits in the town. So there are some, we had subsequently worked with the town of Western to adopt seasonal use zoning, which um, Mark Jebo is saying is a really good addition by towns on top of their minimum maintenance road law to strengthen it. Um, he makes a couple of other recommendations too that we are going to kind of combine into some guidance for the towns. We have not widely um, shared that that decision was made, but we'll do a Tug Hill Times this week and start really getting the word out about that. We feel a little bit better about the whole situation because the law did was upheld. It was just the specifics of the case. So um, for what that's worth, that's where we are with minimum maintenance road law. Any question about that? Katie? Yeah, Lee? Yeah, I, I, I am really new to this and haven't really been asked to opine at all, but I do think, um, and again, I, I haven't read the whole law, but I think uh, there's a really, uh, dangerous sentence in this opinion, if it interprets the law correctly, uh, and the law says, uh, it's, I think it's on the third page, in the full paragraph, sort of in the middle, the judge says, critically, the definition further states that the term minimum maintenance road shall not apply to those roads or road segments which provide access to an individual year-round residence. If that's it, and then you attach all of the appeal procedures that I as a homeowner can come in and say, I'd like you to review it. I think the burden is gonna be always be on the town to prove that it's not a year round resident. 
And it reads to me, and I think judges would be sympathetic to someone who perhaps builds a camp and later turns it into a year round, or God forbid you have two year round residences on the road. It, it seems to me like the town has no choice under the way this opinion is written, but to have the hearing, take cognizance of the fact that there's now a year round residence and upgrade the road. And I think, again, I'm operating just from the face of this opinion, which the judge is sort of floored in some of his language. Um, but I would think regardless of all the other stuff that Jibo said, that one provision is where I would hang my hat on as someone who builds and says, now that this road serves my year round, I have a right to ask you and get you to upgrade it. That was my concern with the decision as well. That puts it basically back to what a seasonal road is. Um, so we're, we're working on trying to come up with something that that's why Katie mentioned the seasonal use zoning. We're trying to make it so that it's a use that's not allowed on the road to be full-time residents. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think that's a really good thing to look at. And, um, you know, just always realize that judges are probably going to be sympathetic when there's tax dollars that can be spent to solve a problem, um, even if they don't have any control over how those tax dollars are really raised or, or that have any sensitivity to where uh, the community may or may not be able to, to allocate. Um, but I think that's, that's a great place to look and see if something can be done um, and sort of have in the back of your mind, even if you do seasonal use zoning, what happens with that when that tenacious homeowner comes in with the bucks to spend on a lawsuit like this to keep worrying it? You know, you need to, to make sure the language going in, they have notice. And it didn't seem like these people had notice based on, the, I'm sure they did. But when you present it in the, in the court and they point to this section of the law, uh, they're going to say, well, that's what we were relying on. So those are my concerns for what they're worth. Yeah, I appreciate that, Lee. And yeah, you, you did hit the nail on the head and, and that's what we're hoping that seasonal use zoning uh, helps cover. And then maybe even other, some other kind of re permit requirement to convert a seasonal camp to your year on use is, is something we're gonna continue talking about. Maybe we should bring you into some of those discussions too, Lee. So I appreciate that. Happy to, yeah, I'm happy to, to be in there if it's, uh, if it's helpful. Thank you. Anything else on that? Um, good, some good Leah, news. I got a question for you, Lee, here. Well, Lee, I've got a question for you here. It looks like it appears that the hinge was that, you know, if a, if a town, you know, provides a zoning permit uh, that is either a seasonal or uh, uh, a, uh, uh, let's call it a land use permit uh, that allows for appropriate setbacks and all that good stuff. But the way I read it, and I'm not an attorney and correct me if I'm wrong, the hinge here was that when Lewis County issued a building permit and after they inspected it, they issued a certificate of occupancy. It wasn't a six month certificate of occupancy, it was a certificate of occupancy. Is that what they're hanging their hand on? I you know, again, I'm going to go back to, I had some real problems deciphering some of what the judge was saying. He, his sentence structure is challenging at best. Um, I, I'm not, I think that was a factor, but I, I still, and I don't know how it was argued, uh, but I, I think the real linchpin was that the law didn't make a distinction, the, the minimum, the the road law didn't make a distinction on when the structure was built, how it was built. It just said what it basically says once there's a year round residence, I have the right to come in and say, I'd like it to be maintained. Uh, and so they had the hearing, they took the evidence and it was pretty clear it was year round. And I, I think it's almost, um, it's almost like at that point, it's a fait accompli 
the town is obligated under this, the way I read this decision in, in interpreting what he seems to be saying about the law. Um, and that's why I think, uh, I do think if you had a seasonal use certificate of occupancy and you had a structure where um, it really sort of goes to the notice to the homeowner um, or the potential homeowner so that when they come in and say, now I want a higher level of service. You can say 10 years ago, five years ago, when you came in and presented us with your more limited plans, you had full notice that you couldn't get more from us um, based on that. And so, um, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, we, it, we've had this problem in, in zoning because it's, because it's an exclusion, you know, the premise in land use in the U.S. is anything that's not prohibited, have at it. Uh, you know, and that's why the abattoir is that next to the single family homes, you zone that away. Uh, it really is providing adequate notice to those people, uh, quite frankly, to take away their arguments, uh, either in front of the town board, the zoning board or the court. Okay, um, should we move on to the next or did you want to continue discussing? Well, we'll I could discuss this all day, but I don't think it's, <laughs> we should probably do it uh, okay. uh, in a different forum. Um, we did have some good news. Uh, the Lorraine Worth court legislation was signed by the governor. So that uh, that is now law which gives um, worth a lot more options. We are having to help them through another temporary appointment as their current, their current temporary appointment expires before they're gonna be able to get um, a, an election in, in order. So um, they've got to do a little bit more, but they will be set once that happens. So that was a good news story. Um, broadband, we can continue to, to really kind of help elevate this issue across the region. Good news in Lewis County, their um, broadband inventory, their field inventory, as well as their survey of users throughout the county is underway, well underway. Um, Jefferson County uh, has also signed on to work with the Development Authority to do a similar study in Jefferson County. Um, I have not heard if that's underway yet. I'm thinking they'll probably wait to the first of the year to at least do the public facing side of that work. Um, also in Oswego County, the, the work is underway through uh, the Central New York Regional Planning and Development Board who used some of their CARES Act funding to bring on a consultant to do this work in four of their five counties, Oswego being one of them. Um, Dave Botar at, at CNY um, has been talking to us quite a bit. He's been very um, helpful. And uh, Oswego County field work was underway uh, last week. I'm not sure if it's completed yet. They were trying to get that done before the snow uh, really flew. And I think they're gonna be able to do that because winter hasn't really started yet too much here. Um, and their survey portion won't start also until after the first of the year. Um, Oneida County continues to be the nugget that we can't quite figure out. Um, we were hoping that perhaps Mohawk Valley Economic Development District would use some of their CARES Act funding to do something similar. Um, la latest conversations we've had with them, they are still kind of figuring out what they're doing with their CARES Act funding. We have shared information with Steve Smith and a new person they brought on board, Mary Kate Mizek. Um, Central New York, when they did their RFP process, did ask the consultants replying to that RFP to add, add uh, a little information if Oneida County wanted to be added onto Central New York's contract, how much that would cost. Um, so we have that piece of information, have shared that with Mohawk Valley Economic Development District. Um, and so that continues to be something we're really trying to um, prioritize. Um, we think it's a real issue in the Northern Oneida County Council of Governments. We've heard from, we, we know that it's an issue from various people um, over the years and, and very recently. We know Forest Port has been very active in some of this and their supervisor uh, has been uh, pr uh, very proactive. Um, 
so this is uh, something we may be talking to NOCOG about on Thursday to let them know the details of some of that because it really affects them uh, and go from there. So, but, but there's definitely a lot of activity, a lot of staff time being spent and hopefully in the long run um, improvements on broadband in the region. Katie, if I could add, there's been more schools in uh, the NOCOG area that are going fully remote. And I, I hear from different parents that even though the schools are re, uh, supplying hotspots for some of the more rural uh, residences, access to have their children log on and use the internet continues to be a problem. You know, it's so it, it's better than it was but I think it's just brought it more out into the forefront. Uh, what a problem that is. Um, so I guess that's both good news and bad news. Um, Steve Smith is a member of the local government education committee. And we had a uh, go to meeting call last week. And it seems like they have an awful lot of stuff going on. So you know, I, I would continue to keep contacting him. He did say that they, that they did bring on a new staff member, but um, I think that, you know, larger municipalities just tend to get more attention. And his region also includes Herkimer County. Uh, there's a lot going on there with Remington, et cetera. So, you know. Yeah, Mary Kate is that new staff person. So we've been talking with her because she's been tasked to figure out to some extent how this CARES Act funding is going to be spent. Our, what we have heard is that some of the other counties in his district are very interested in looking at child care issues. Um, and they would like to see the planning money be spent with that. Or um, I'm not sure if that's the same issue or um, of importance in Oneida County. Um, the, the dollar amount to add Oneida County to the Central New York contract is $67,000. Um, you know, we've been trying to think of creative ways to split that amongst some various stakeholders um, to make it more doable. Uh, so that's something we wanted to talk to NOCOG about. Um, we talked to Oneida County about in the past, and we might need to talk to Oneida County again. Um, maybe some kind of three-way partnership trying to think outside the box. Would there be anything available through the Community Foundation of Oneida and Herkimer County? That's a good idea. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. Okay. Maybe we should talk offline, Jerry, about that a little bit too. Thank you. The same, same conditions in Osceola. They're making improvements all the time, but um, there are people whose the the Verizon line or whatever line it is goes right by the end of their road, but they don't take it up the road. I have a, a youngster that um, his, his mother has a key to the library and he comes in almost daily now that Camden is on full um, virtual and he, there's no way he can access anything at home. He has, he has to come in to the library or go to Camden. And it's, it, it really is sad. I will make sure I send to all of you um, that link to the Lewis County survey, because that's a really important thing to, to have people fill that out that don't have good internet. And if they can't fill it out from home, there's a way to fill that out in paper and send it into the county. Um, Leona and, and Jan and Roger, I will send that to you and ask you to share that with any of your people. Um, I think that survey is open at least through the end of the month. Um, that's a good way to document their location and what their current situation is with internet to inform this process. Okay, thank you. Now in, the, in this area, it's not only students. Some of the staff, the teachers, are having problems. Uh, they have to go to the school or at least sit in the parking lot to get access. So it's not a good way to try to learn well, or work or anything. <coughs> no. We have uh, here in the core forest in Montague, I would say right now that Frontier has 
<clears throat> put fiber optic lines on the uh, national grid poles. About 95% of every pole in this town has fiber optics on it now. In fact, I, as I look across my, my office window, I, I've got a uh, power pole that's about 100 yards away that services my house. And there is a very large loop of fiber optics line that they left and also a box, a junction box for fiber optics. So before the crews from North Carolina and South Carolina left for the season, I asked them when the uh, final mile was going to happen. When were they going to actually connect all these, these services to the houses? And the only response I got was they pointed up at the box. I said, that's going to be 80 megabytes per second. You're going to love it. And I says, okay, but when are they going to hook it up? He goes, not my job. <laughs> you know, so, so we have service now to the smallest town in the state. But uh, I, I am assuming it's going to be 2021 summer before they actually do final mile and hook that up, which is, again, there uh, we have power poles through the uh, rural electrification that happened in the 50s up here that are in places that you would have never imagined that there's that there's uh, power. In fact, uh, they, they still struggle that they never got easements. They just put power poles up in the 50s, but they're right. They've run a lot of expensive fiber optics on those poles. Like I said, uh, we have we uh, fiber optics all the way to the town of Redfield now, which is amazing to me. <laughs> so hopefully we get it next year. And I, I do have the uh, survey. They did pass it on. We did it. And I passed it on to some other people in the area. Okay, great. Yeah, I was able to just buy uh, in Boylston 50-50. Uh, so 50 up and 50 down megabits per second. So I was pretty, pretty pleased about that through Frontier. Um, a couple of other things. Uh, I also, I think I sent you a proposal for a snowmobile economic impact study. Um, Lewis County Economic Development has some new leadership there. Um, Brittany Davis and her staff had reached out to several of us and we did, did a Zoom meeting a couple of weeks ago. One of the things that they have prioritized is to do an economic impact study of snowmobiling. Um, their geography was originally kind of Lewis County, understandably, and, and we were really suggesting that they broaden that to include the whole Tug Hill region. Um, first of all, you know, selfishly, we care about the entire region, but, you know, really, I think that in reality, it's hard to, to pull out just Lewis County snowmobilers. And when you're on the hill, you're fluidly traveling between all four counties when you're up on the core where all the snow is. So they were very open to that um, suggestion. And their project was originally kind of scoped to just be done by the Center for Community Studies. You might remember them. They did our um, Tug Hill resident landowner survey the last two times. And Joel did that great presentation at our last annual meeting at the Vineyards. They're, you know, they're definitely a top-notch survey outfit um, getting out to the communities. However, I did suggest to Brittany that they need somebody else as part of that project that has the real economic development teeth and, and um, a little bit of a reputation and the analysis um, skills to put the finishing touches on the data that the center will collect. So they brought on Kamoin, who you may remember Kamoin over the years, we've worked with them. Um, they did the ATV economics impact study back in the mid 2000s. Again, that was actually with the Center for Community Studies too, out on the trails intersecting intercepting ATV riders to, to get a sense of what their spending habits were. And um, so that's gonna be, I think, a very exciting project. Um, we need to have an updated figure on the economic impact of snowmobiling on the, in the region. It's, it's one of the you know, main drivers um, recreation-wise. They snowmobilers spend a lot of money. And if, you're, if we're gonna be making recommendations or talking about policy things statewide, we need to have some of those figures to, to to um, communicate the importance of, of the activity. So um, we can either do this now or we can do it in the financial statement part, but um, I would like the commission to be part of that study um, and, and, and support the effort. Um, the, the expense that they've attached to that is a $22,000 study. I know Lewis County has $10,000 in hand. Um, I would like to consider supporting that study um, for, with $5,000, we've looked at um, our financial statement. We've been very frugal all year long, kind of preparing for the potential of a mid-year significant budget cut or potentially some kind of 
scenario where we'd have to um, have a personnel cut. And so we were trying to make sure we were in a position to not do that. I think we were gonna make it through this fiscal year without some, something like that happening. We have a lot of um, money unallocated that I um, would like to say we could take 5,000 and allocate that to our admin line to support the, the snowmobile study. Now, if anyone has any questions or if anyone read that proposal. So it'd be only for Lewis County or the whole Tug Hill? The whole Tug Hill. She's revised it to be all of Tug Hill. I just want to clarify because I, I, I don't think we should, as a commission, support one particular county over all others. But I think that that would be beneficial because Parish has a huge, we've had considered our comprehensive plan that we're now revising as a huge snowmobile trailhead in our town. And I think any of those figures would be exceedingly helpful for us as we move forward. Nope, um, she revised the, the proposal, proposal to reflect all of Tug Hill. The remain, so if, if we were are, are able to, to contribute the 5,000, that leaves um, still, I think, a $7,000 shortfall. Um, the intention is to go to the other three counties and ask them to also participate by putting some money, hopefully, on the table. That way, it really is a true four county effort. Yeah, I think Dave Turner, who's the tourism director at the Swigo, I think that that would be excellent because they have combined with other counties, one of them a number of years, well, not a number, a few years ago with the uh, fisheries uh, on the uh, Lake Ontario. And that one report um, was kind of a cutting edge report. Hasn't been redone, though it probably should be at this point, but it, it provided a lot of very good numbers to run for marinas to uh justify their economic importance in the area. So something like a Tug Hill snowmobile one would be similar to that because I think that in the winter is basically a huge tourist attraction. I agree. Hey, would you like to move on that now or you wanna to wait to your, uh, to present the budget? Um, I, I think we could move on it now. Um, Everyone's had the financial statement and, and we're in, in good shape. Yep. Good. Can I have a motion to, uh, to uh, accept as we proposed uh, a contribution of $5,000 from our, uh, our uh, general fund to, to, uh, to uh, fund this Camion study for, uh, for a snowmobile impact study on Tug Hill. Can I have a motion for that? I'll move. You want a second? All those in favor? Aye. I think we got everybody. Thank you. All right, thanks. That um, will keep you in apprised. I mean, that's going to move pretty fast. The goal is to have um, the Center for Community Studies on the trails, pray for snow, um, probably at the beginning of February or during February break, um, which is a big snowmobile um, week on Tug Hill to do the uh, data collection part of this. So we'll keep you in the loop. Um, renewable energy projects. Oh, there's a, there's a, there is concerns. I think one thing we just got to keep in mind that, that there is going to be concerns this, this winter. Um, <clears throat> there has been some grants that were afforded to, to some locations to provide outside entertainment for snowmobilers. I'm, I'm deeply concerned with COVID. Um, how the majority of the, uh, the bars and restaurants on Tug Hill are going to survive um, are they going to, uh, you know, are they going to follow the, the rules and regulations from the uh, public health? Uh, or are they just going to free wheel here? Uh, there is money available out there. I don't think a lot of businesses have taken advantage of that, but there is money out there if you want to make some changes to outdoor uh, gathering and, and be able to serve outdoors. But uh, I, I'm deeply concerned going into uh, when we do get snow that it's going to be a free for all. And I, I just think this is going to be a horrible transmission. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I, I'm, you know, it's bad for the industry. And we also have to keep that in mind for the students that'll be out there, but it'll be, I'm sure they will be outdoors taking precautions um, as far as the interviews go. And it also could impact, you know, the quality of the data. Like, will as many people be snowmobiling on Tug Hill, you know, this year because of it? I don't know, we'll have to, we'll have to be thinking about all those as they structure the, the project for sure. I know um, in Old Forge, Town of Webb, they are pushing 
for people to come up there and cut loose. That's kind of, you know, you've been trapped in your house, come up and snowmobile and ski and enjoy the outdoors. They've had a lot of advertising already and there's really no snow. <laughs> and no snow in the immediate uh, forecast, so. Yep. Um, renewable energy shifting gears. Um, there was some news last week that the Mad River Wind Farm um, has withdrawn from Article 10. Uh, that was uh, surprising. Uh, I think we've been seeing and we've been waiting for a lot of these Article 10 wind and solar farms, um, kind of watching to see what they were going to do as the new Office for Renewable Energy Deciding gets their new regs uh, um, in place and anticipate that many of those Article 10s will switch over to the new process, which is to be more streamlined. Um, and a few of them have, not any in our region yet, um, although we're, we're hearing that they might, but Mad River has withdrawn, which means that the project is, is no longer. Um, so that, that was a surprise. Um, uh, there's some thought that they may come back with a revised project, who knows? Um, the, the town of Worth did just revise their, or is in the process of revising their wind law right now, which is gonna make them a, um, a, a little bit more open to wind. Um, but for the time being, that project is, is done. I know um, Elena and Matt have been spending a lot of time in the town of Watertown with Mr. Boxberger and company on um, some <laughs> significant um, amendments to their uh, codes and laws, um, specifically a lot of that around the Greens Corners large solar farm being proposed in the towns of Watertown and Houndsfield, I believe. Right, that was actually submitted to the uh, town board this past week and they forwarded on to the county for review. So we have to really give thanks to Elena and Matt. Those guys have been really awesome to help us during this project especially with me not being able to be there. They, they put up with a lot. So thank you guys. Our pleasure, Tom. So that um, we will share that with anybody who wants to see what the town of Watertown has come up with as far as their setbacks and coverage areas and that kind of thing. Um, you know, a lot of towns are struggling with how they want to change their laws, especially with this new um, 94C process um, in the offing. Everyone's trying to get what they want on their local laws um, finalized. So that'll be taken into consideration under the new process. Um, that's all I got for renewable energy. We are putting together a first quarter of 2021 training schedule. Um, Jan pointed out the, the good uh, Constable Chronicles uh, series that we did. And I wanna give an early shout out to something Leona and her son Peter are putting together that is gonna be our, our winter series titled Letters from a Tug Hill Logger. Leona, do you wanna talk a little bit about that? I have several scrapbooks of my grandfather's and one in particular has all his letters that he um, corresponded with the Deacon Doubleday in Syracuse. And quite often he was talking with him on the telephone during his broadcasts. And um, people all over the area, all over the region, um, listened to it. And he talked about the good old days in the, in the forest on Tug Hill. Um, maybe from the turn of the century forward to 1950. And so we're, we're working um, at getting together some presentations complete with pictures and artifacts um, that, that we can present in three different um, meetings or webinar kind of things. And uh, hopefully, hopefully it'll uh, draw some attention and and uh, be enjoyed by a lot of people. So that'll be at the end of January. There'll be uh, end of January, end of February, and end of March webinars for those in the style of the Constable Chronicles. I think it'll be a lot of fun and uh, look forward to that. It'll be something to do in the winter, the long winter that we are <laughs> looking at. 
Uh, so look for uh, ways to sign up for that soon. We are also doing um, you no know, less fun, but just as important sessions um, for our local officials. Um, we're actually jumping the gun and doing one between Christmas and New Year's. <laughs> December 29th is kind of a late breaking um, need that uh, has been highlighted by several of the circuit riders um, with this new requirement for emergency plans that are due, I think the beginning of April, um, communities have to go through a whole process of putting this together, kind of how, they, how to respond to crises like we're facing right now. So we'll be having a session on that December 29th. Um, and then there's several others. And we'll, we'll once we have all the descriptions and a little bit of a, a flyer, we'll make sure all, all of you have that. And it'll be in Tug Hill Times as well. Um, lastly, uh, the 488 issue paper, uh, I did send a revised version of that that um, Jen and Angie have been working on um, very hard. Uh, it's just about done. We're just waiting for a final updated table from Candy Aiken in Lewis County to show the final implications in Osceola. And then we will release that after the first of the year. We had a really good call with DEC about this. They're very supportive and had some really good information for us to include in that paper. Um, I think this is going to be a statewide, uh, it's something that's going to get some statewide attention and uh, may even get looped into some of the Climate Action Council um, work that's underway right now. So I could go on and on, but I won't. Um, I will stop talking and turn it over to the circuit riders or to back to Jan. Thanks, Katie. Um, We'll do the sell a card. Who wants to go first for Council of Government's reports? <laughs> I can go first. Who would like to start? Oops. I can go first. This is Jean Waterbury. Okay. Um, Thanks, Jeannie. I'll, I'll be talking about no cog. Um, so with the uh, Harlan's retirement, uh, we've had to find uh, another uh, associate circuit rider, and we were lucky enough to have the supervisor from Stuben throw his na name in the ring, Joe Roll Rollins. Um, and we thought that uh, he would be a great um, addition to the team of Lisa Bellinger and John Hill. So as of the at our next meet at the NOCOG um, executive board meeting on Thursday at two o'clock, it'll be a Zoom meeting. Um, uh, the, the board will approve a contract with uh, Joe for one year starting January 1st. Um, Joe is the supervisor, was the supervisor for Stu Ben. He has had to step down from that position. Um, and from what I've heard, they have somebody new stepping in, in to that position as supervisor. But Joe is also on the executive board for NOCOG. So he's going to have to resign his position on the NOCOG executive board. Luckily, we have... Um, as someone that is interested in being on the board, um, Ed Davis from the town of Lee has um, accepted that position. So our meeting on Thursday, will talk about all these changes. <laughs> um, I have been getting a lot of requests for um, Zoom meetings since the executive, um, the county executive recommended that there be no in-person meeting in, in um, no in-person governmental meeting in Oneida County as of last Monday. So NOCOG is, um, or the commission is doing quite a few NOCOG um, board meetings. Um, there are several boards that do have their own equipment and or are using uh, Microsoft Teams. Um, I think the next couple months are going to be uh, a flurry of Zoom meetings um, at, the, at the town and village board level. Um, I think I reported at the last meeting that NOCOG was able, able to hire someone to do the GPS work. Um, Mark Clark uh, lives in Camden, 
and is good friends with uh, Bob Sauer. Bob Sauer is actually the one that recommended Mark. So Bob has been keeping a keeping tabs on Mark, which is good. <laughs> um, but Mark has was able to do some work in Annsville with the GPS uh, units. Um, he was also able to do start some work in Camden. However, the gentleman that he was working with ended up testing positive for COVID. So that kind of put a abrupt halt to that, that work. Um, I talked to Bob this morning and Mark is willing to do some work this, this winter, um, maybe hydrant work, you know, finding hydrant stuff. Um, so he, Mark is going to be available on a as needed basis or do some GPS work as, as he can. So um, that's that. Um, and I think uh, um, I, we did send out um, to NOCOG membership in September because uh, NOCOG was not able to do its annual meeting. Uh, it sent out, we sent out a package of information to NOCOG members to vote on uh, next year's budget to vote on officers uh, for the executive board to approve the minutes from last year's meeting and there's a couple other things that I send out. Um, I did it with a Google Forms survey. I got back 10 communities that voted on it so that was a majority of the of the membership. We have 17 members so 10 is more than a majority so I'm calling that good for passing all the things that we sent out. <laughs> um, like I said, we'll have a board meeting on um, Thursday. We'll hopefully uh, Katie and or Elena or Carla can talk to the board about the bi um, broadband project. Um, I know there's some money that um, we're trying to get um, approved. I, I We just need to talk to the board and see what their um, interest in is, interest is in, in supporting that project. Um, I can't remember. Is there anything else, Katie? I think that's all I have. Jean, how did you make out with support from Oneida County this year? Um, we sent in their, their Typical request is for $7,500. The board um, this spring recommended that they only submit a request for $2,000. Um, John submitted, John Dorian sent, sent in that request and has not heard anything from um, Oneida County. So at, at this point, I have a feeling that they're not gonna get anything. Was it in the county budget line for anything? I mean, you uh, the tentative, uh, you know, the tentative budget was out, and I don't know if they approved the final budget. <clears throat> but usually, you can go online and, or at least contact county planning. Okay. There's been a shakeup at county planning. There's a new commissioner. Yes. Um, one yeah. long-term employee, Guy Sassaman. Uh, left about two months ago. He did? Uh, yeah. I didn't know that. Hmm. Yeah. Ooh. Hired the county offered early retirement. And Regina Vitozzi is leaving uh, next week. Really? Matt and I have spoken with James Genovese, the new planning commissioner. Yeah. And I believe Matt is going to be talking to someone else in the planning department who is involved with comp plan review here shortly. Okay. I think while Regina was doing a lot of that stuff, she was kind of like the acting commissioner. Everybody right. assumed she was going to be appointed. That didn't happen uh, about six or eight months ago. Right. Uh, so she's kind of decided to move on. <laughs> Re retire? Is that a retire or found, found another job? Well, she said she's leaving county service, but she's not retiring. So. Mm. Okay. Uh, that's a good point though, Jerry, about checking the budget, we can do that. Okay. It's under the county planning. Yep. Yeah.
I guess that's all I have. For Thanks, Gene. Thank you, Gene. Uh, who's next? Well, I can go next. The, uh, <laughs> okay, yeah, Paul. Pretty brief. Uh, North Shore and Salmon Rivers, both groups met in uh, November. And uh, th at this point, because of COVID, we're not sure when the next meeting is going to be. We were talking about early in 2021, but it depends on the COVID situation and on uh, the need for a meeting, what we need to get together on to, to talk about. Uh, our meetings in November uh, for North Shore was in person and Salmon Rivers was a, uh, a hybrid meeting where some people were at the uh, Albion Municipal Building and some were uh, accessing it remotely and that seemed to work pretty well. Um, we are, as uh, NOCOG is as well, we are seeking a uh, contractor to assist me with uh, meeting coverage. We have at least one candidate that I'm uh, talking to about how to get things in place by uh, January 1st. So we'll be able to roll with that. Uh, we are actively seeking additional uh, candidates as well. Um, budget season, of course, has come to an end uh, pretty much. They're just uh, working on the details of wrapping up things with filing with the county and so on. Uh, and of course, now we're segueing, now we're in the holidays, but we're also segueing into, uh, as Katie mentioned, the uh, public employer emergency health plans. And although there is a uh, later spring deadline, there's an earlier deadline of February 4th if uh, there's a union involved. So it's actually quite a lot more urgent than that. And that's uh, complicated by the entire COVID situation and the uh, difficulties that gives us in terms of getting groups together to work on things. Uh, my municipalities, overall, both on the town and village board level and the planning board level, have been moving away from uh, the public having access to their municipal buildings. A growing number of them have once again closed their municipal buildings uh, to the public, which also implies that when they're having their municipal board meetings, those are closed to the public as well. And we're implementing Zoom in uh, multiple cases to have a hybrid meeting where it may be that the municipal board meets at the municipal building or they have a hybrid the meeting themselves where some are at the municipal building and some are from home. But in any case, the meeting is uh, extended to the public. The public's only access is via Zoom. So that's a, a strong change I'm seeing effective in December. That's been a big, a big change over November, and it's because of the rising, uh, the rising statistics, and of course the uh, vaccination and the effectiveness of that that hasn't really started yet. So I'm expecting, as Jen mentioned, that hopefully we'll see some improvements in uh, that in 2021. But we're still quite a ways away from that, and people are appropriately being being cautious. So as I'm sure all of us know, a good number of our municipal officials are in the uh, vulnerable population and uh, nobody wants to uh, be impacted by COVID. And as we were talking about earlier with the public employer emergency health plans, our municipalities are currently dealing with the impacts of COVID right now and lots of people working in close proximity. If you have a couple guys in a highway truck, a driver and a wingman uh, for a prolonged period of time in a confined environment, you're they talking about a high risk uh, environment and uh, they are coming to grips with what happens if somebody has a potential exposure or if somebody actually is uh, diagnosed with a positive uh, COVID case. You know, what do they do? How do they continue to operate when the crews are small to begin with? And I will tell you that my municipalities are currently having real problems with recruiting additional people for the seasonal uh, employees that they normally draw on for uh, winter time. So they're not only are they small crews, but they're shorter than they usually are. Uh, so they're they're struggling and COVID could make uh, make that even worse. So everybody's trying to be careful, but it is, although none of my municipalities are happy with the prospect of jumping through additional hoops, I think in a practical sense, they do realize the 
absolute necessity of coming up with a contingency plan should uh, COVID strike too close to home. Um, so that's uh, basically what's going on in the uh, North Shore and Salmon Rivers area. The COVID is continuing to be a major player shaping what municipalities are doing and can do. And uh, it has, you know, the Zoom meetings have brought a new dimension to our municipal meetings. Uh, even before the COVID uh, infection rate grew worse, uh, some of my municipalities appreciated the ability to do a meeting at least partially via Zoom because it gave people access to the meeting who didn't have it before, who even before COVID may have had uh, problems with dealing with crowds and potential infection. And also from time to time, we've had uh, board members or town attorneys or uh, things like that where they were out of town on the board meeting night, either by schedule or by something that came up unexpectedly. And it's uh, allowed them to connect in a way that wasn't uh, possible before. So Zoom has definitely been a, uh, a valuable resource in this period. And uh, I think my communities are, are grateful to uh, Tug Hill for facilitating all the help we've been able to be to them. Good. Thanks, Paul. Any questions? Thank you. Again, thanks, Paul. We have, uh, who wants to be next? Angie, Mickey, your choice. I can go. Well, I'll try to be quick. Um, <laughs> I've got, uh, I've got a lot of towns, even though this is an off town election year, a lot of towns that have had retirements or resignations um, that they're, that they either filled at the last election or having to fill by appointment. A couple of long timers, uh, town of Adams, highway superintendent, um, Terry, oh my God, I lost his last name. Yeah, retired, Parker. thank you, uh, retired um, after 30 years. He retired at the end of October. So they've appointed somebody until they can fill that position next uh, month. And the, the longest one I've heard ever, I think, uh, Fred Overton from the town of Worth. He's worked for their highway department for 48 years. Uh, when their highway superintendent resigned last fall, he took an appointment as their highway superintendent this year. Uh, but he has retired as of the end of this year. Town of Worth did a nice presentation at their last meeting and gave him a nice uh, plaque and stuff. 48 years of service is a long time to work for a town. Um, they did have uh, somebody win their election by write-in for the highway superintendent. It's a lady, Elizabeth King. Um, first time I've heard that one uh, uh, since <coughs> I've been here anyway. Uh, so he Any relation written, to Ron King? I, I'm not sure. Some of them said Elizabeth Aubin. Some said Elizabeth King. Some said Elizabeth King Aubin or Aubin King. So I'm not sure which is her maiden name. That's, so, that's Ronnie King Jr.'s daughter, Elizabeth. Very good. He probably knows how to run trucks then. Right. So it's good. So anyway, she she should be taken over in June. She, she's a tri she's actually a truck driver. She's she hauls she hauls logs for her dad. So yes. Excellent. Good news. So she'll be taken over as the highway superintendent in Worth. Um, of course, it's midterm, so she'll have to run again next fall. But she'll be taken over in January. So that's exciting. Uh, Harrisburg's town clerk is also resigning. Uh, I don't have a name for a new person there. Um, and there's been a couple other uh, miscellaneous planning and zoning board and whatever resignations. But uh, another big one, the, the town justice for our Harrisburg Montague Pinckney town court, only our second one since that court's been in existence, has resigned. Um, a new judge was elected this uh, fall at the, the election. Candace Randall, who's an, uh, an attorney in uh, the Lewis County area, has taken that position. However, she was on Pinckney's planning board, so she had to resign from that. So as I said, it's just a domino effect, but quite a few uh, changes in some of my local officials. I've sent a pile of stuff to Gwen the other day, but I've got more coming. Uh, I've got a few towns and villages working on water and sewer. Um, projects. I mentioned most of them last month. Seaville did hire a new water plant operator. They've been looking for several months. So that's good news for them. Uh, in Port Leiden, uh, Lionsdale has, so has been refusing to make a water district for the outside users. The village did put some pressure on them to do that. Um, they said they were starting the process, but as of last month, I think the uh, Port Leiden board is going to do something to cut off, to cut off the 
outside users in lion's sale because I'm guessing the petition process is not moving along swiftly. So there's still no water district there. Oh, shoot. One other thing I wanted to mention resignation wise, uh, retirement wise, Terry Dack, who's a bookkeeper for the town of Rodman and also for there for, for the CTHC is retiring. Um, Rodman is looking for new people and I'm not sure if she's going to stay with CTHC or not afterwards, but I'll let you know on that one, but she's the CTHC bookkeeper as well. Um, some region wide stuff. Oswego County, two of my Oswego County towns have got highway employees who are currently quarantined because of COVID. Um, so they're, we're working on getting some training in uh, for each county with the highway departments and whatever to find out, you know, what they should do, who's going to cover, how are they going to run their departments or whatever. So we're working on that. Uh, Lewis County uh, has a new planner. Cassandra Buell moved up to the, the director of planning position and they've hired a new guy whose name is Kevin, can't remember his last name. Um, uh, they're countywide gonna be working on climate smart communities projects. So they're gonna be around and seeing if some of the towns wanna pick up that project or work on uh, the uh, clean energy communities thing. A couple of my towns have started that. Uh, also the Snow Pals have started contacting boards about the SNRT run for this year. Um, they still have not finalized or made any sort of restitution for all the damage that was done on the roads in 2019. So most of the towns are not looking real favorable, nor is the county. We'll see what happens there. They just started that process. It was just popping up in the notes in December. Um, my uh, Elena and I are going around to some of my towns and working on getting the mini plans, the mini comp plans uh, approved that we had done for them, had an intern do for them a couple years ago. So we're working on that. I think I mentioned in October, but I can't remember, but Pinckney, the last of my original 16 towns has approved their special areas map, the update, e um, Also official highway maps, um, which most of them approved several years ago. We are going back to, around with updates to make sure those get reapproved and filed correctly this time. Um, and a lot of my towns, as both Gina and Paul mentioned, have gone back to either Zoom meetings or some sort of Zoom hybrid meeting and more of them are popping in all the time, so. Um, and in other CTHC news, my final news, uh, as Jean did, we did not have a fall meeting. I sent out the budget and such uh, to all my people electronically, and I did get 20 of 21 votes, and, my, and the budget for CTHC for next year did pass. So uh, I probably will have an executive committee meeting either near the end of this month or early next month to, to uh, see what direction we're moving in for next year. I think that's all I have, unless you have any questions for me. Thanks, Angie. Any questions? Thank you. Mickey? Yep. Uh, so right now, um, the LED lighting project continues to move forward. Um, the, so far, the only two communities who have dropped out have been Champion and Casperland. Um, pretty much all the rest, I believe, are going to move forward uh, going through the New York Power Authority program. And we also are, Jefferson County was submitting a shared service plan. And then we caught wind of that from Scott Burdo, the mayor for West Carthage. So we reached out to Lewis County, Kaden and I did. And we talked with uh, Cassandra Buell over there at Lewis County Planning and, and Ryan Pache. And so they are actually, Lewis County is gonna be submitting their first shared service plan. Um, and part of that's gonna be the LED lighting project which um, if everything goes well, the savings that we're showing that the communities will get basically uh, uh, a financial like reimbursement back to them for would be over $500,000 for the whole group, Jefferson Lewis County. So that's something extra for these communities on top of the grant that uh, we obtained for them and also the national grid incentive and also the NIPA grant. So there's, there's a lot of money coming in for those communities right now to help offset costs. So that's a good thing. Um, with that, uh, the other thing is the group has been looking at community choice aggregation. We um, we had a, at the last Ray Cog board meeting, we had uh, Lewis County Planning, Cassandra Buell and uh, and Kevin, I can't think of his last name. It's Rulliard. Rulliard, yeah, thank you, Katie. Uh, he kind of came and they did a little presentation about uh, community choice aggregation because Lewis County is looking into it and trying to maybe reach out to their municipalities about doing something related to that. Um, 
as well as uh, Jefferson County has been looking at it. Some of those communities over there, West Carthage has already approved to move forward with good energy along with Town of Champion. We actually had good energy do a presentation back in September to RACOG. So after we actually have a webinar tomorrow at six o'clock, that's gonna be a community choice aggregation, clean energy communities and climate smart communities webinar. So we're gonna have uh, Lewis County Planning is gonna be speaking about the clean energy communities and the CCA along with Jules Assets, is another administrator like Good Energy is of the program. They'll be talking about the community choice aggregation and uh, Jen Perry from ANCA is gonna be talking about uh, climate smart. Or, I'm sorry, uh, Jen Perry is gonna be from ANCA is gonna be talking about clean energy communities and Lewis County Planning is gonna be talking about climate smart communities. So we have that webinar tomorrow at 6, 6 p.m. Tomorrow it's gonna be a remote Zoom session. Um, emergency planning has what kind of already been mentioned previously. Um, a few of my communities had, uh, you know, reached out to me about the fact, you know, like what are they going to do this winter if the crews get quarantined or get sick and who's going to cover. So I know Katie um, started reaching out and, um, and then we had Jen and Jean jump in and then then we actually had a group meeting with all the circuit riders kind of talking about it and, and what our other communities are facing too. And um, so basically at this point, it sounds like uh, each of the county highway departments are putting together plans for their communities. And, uh, and I do sense like in RACOG, there seems to be some of the communities still would like to, I think, to engage each other, even though they're in different counties because they would, they're close proximity to other communities that they work with. Uh, doing shared service stuff. So, um, so I know they're still looking at maybe doing something, talk, having some discussions about uh, RACOG members helping each other out during this time too. So we'll continue to look at that. And then that, Katie already mentioned about the pandemic emergency planning webinar that's going to be held on December 29th. Um, you know, Jean and Jennifer and Katie all then pulled all that together. Um, so that's great something the communities really were asking for and, and they needed it soon. Um, and to kind of reiterate what Paul had mentioned too, um, Town of Wilna, uh, their most senior person on their highway department is gonna have three years in, and that's it. Um, they've actually been having a hard time filling positions. They normally have 70 applicants for these, uh, for their positions and they've only had like nine. So their most recent position requiring a CDL they only had nine, normally they get 70. So very struggling a lot right now to find people. So that's another concern as we approach this winter time. Uh, discussions on a railroad bed from Laval to Carthage took place also at the last RACI board meeting. Lewis County Planning did an update as far as uh, what they're looking into at this point. Lewis County is not really looking into doing too much with a railroad bed. They had discussed about getting the buildings originally, but. Um, from what I understand is that they dropped that and then the developer went ahead and purchased those buildings at Ron Trottier. Uh, he did move a locomotive to the village of Lowell. Uh, he did buy the old depot building in Carthage. He bought the old railroad buildings in Lowell and he bought uh, the Memories restaurant down in town of Watson. Um, so he is looking to do pedal cars from Lowell to Carthage and hopefully like I guess that's like a train from Laval to Casterland over to the Depot Museum. So I think right now Lewis County is kind of looking at maybe at doing a walking trail potentially in Village of Laval section maybe and then just seeing how the pedal cars play out on the rest because the developer is getting a long-term lease with the railroad company so GBT. So uh, that's where that looks. All the members pretty much all agreed on wanting to see something happen in that railroad bed. I think some are in favor of seeing how the pedal cars play out and some I think would like to see a multi-use trail. But at this point, it looks like uh, the pedal cars will be the first thing that'll be tested. There was talk of doing a potential survey for the region to see what the public would like to see happen. So that still might happen. I'm, I'm not sure. We'll see how things pan out. But they wanted to get an idea of what the public would like to see. Uh, RACOG might be getting bigger. Um, Village of Lavo had um, shown some interest in joining RACOG. 
Um, it was brought up at their last meeting, and I believe they'll be bringing it up at their meeting this Wednesday about potentially joining. And uh, Wayne McElroy, um, president slash mayor for Village of Carthage, he um, is in you know favor of seeing them join because they give him another village about his size as part of the Raycock community to work with. So, and Matt and Elena continue to work with the level on their comprehensive plans and continue to do the meetings with that. So I thank them for everything and moving that forward. And there's also now a website page devoted to the comprehensive plan for that on the tunnel level, tunnel level website. So that's what I got, unless you got other questions. Mickey, I just wanted to add Thanks, that Mickey. in yep. Old in Old Forge this this summer, they yep. started uh, the rail bike program starting in Thundera. I know somebody that works there. They were extremely busy. And I think it was like 10 miles. I don't know if it was five each way or 10 each way, but uh, the man that works there is from Force Sport, retired uh, as a sheriff deputy. And since he's worked there, has lost 40 pounds. <laughs> because if they show up with three people, he's number four. <laughs> on the rail bike but he said it's been very very popular up there so that may be something they want to look at as well yeah and that's what lewis county i think brought that up that they heard that old forge had uh started doing the rail bikes there just to try to help offset things right. the times of covid 19 wow. and it seemed to sound like it's been doing pretty well so yeah. that's a sign so. <laughs> thanks jerry yeah Any other questions for the River Area Council of Government? Mickey? Okay, thanks, Mickey. Um, finance report, uh, Katie. Everyone got that on their email. Um, you know, we've continued to be, um, you know, very, very careful with expenses as we discussed earlier. Um, so I, I have no concerns that we're going to go over any of our lines any any uh, with any significance, and I think we'll be under on most of them. Um, Felicia's on. If Felicia, if you wanted to say anything, no, I don't. I don't have. I'm. It, feel free to ask any questions. But um, like Katie said, we've been very careful on our spending, so um, no concerns at this time. Um, there are some credit card um, reconciliations that have been through, they just hadn't hit the re reporting in Albany, so they're not reflective on that statement, but um, nothing major. And we do continue to not have um, scheduled raises for staff that continues to be held up in Albany for all MCs. Any questions? Good. Any uh, any public comment? Anybody would like to say anything? Or we open up the floor. Well, I I can say that I really appreciate all the extra work and time it takes for all of you to carry on <clears throat> all the staff. It's it it really is difficult. I know. Um, but we appreciate all your work and extra, extra things that you're doing. Thank you, Leona. Yes, thank you very much, Leona. Thanks, Leona. And Pete's, Pete's dogs are keeping me company still. <laughs> They're my favorite fans. <laughs> Good. Yeah, it's a dead giveaway. You know I'm coming when they start barking. <laughs> <laughs> well good thank you uh it looks like our next zoom meeting will be on january 25th god willing uh with that if there's no other questions or comments uh, i guess i need to have a motion to adjourn jan i just had one comment yes uh, katie did oh, you sure, sure i'm sorry take, did you want to try and take a picture I don't oh know. i had forgotten I about that i know um, we could just um if everyone wants to like just look nice and smile for a second, we'll take a quick uh, snip of the of the uh, meeting here.
and uh, we may use it in, in uh, headwaters, which we are using or we are working on right now. So uh, let me see if I can make this work. See what I had in the background during laundry or something like that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. Okay, let me see. I I'm put my Christmas hat on. One, one second. Make, make, sure you get my, make sure you get my horns. <laughs> okay, we'll see if it works. Thank you. Happy New Year. Yes, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Healthy, happy holiday. Nice holiday. Healthy. Healthy. Good to see you all. Carolyn. And, uh, we'll, 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 uh, we, again, I don't think we had a motion, but I, we're good with it. Oh, <laughs> I'm a good one. Oh yeah, we did get one. <laughs> we'll come up with something. <laughs> I I can make a motion. Have a nice holiday. Okay. Thanks so much. You're on there, Leona and Tom. You're up. Good. Okay, sounds good. Happy holidays. Happy yeah. holidays. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Bye, bye now. Be safe and healthy. Okay. Did anybody yeah. bring the cookies today? <laughs> oh, yeah. Cookies. They were delivered yesterday to my house. Oh, lucky you. <laughs> Enjoy them for us. Bye.